Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming to our website to view these online presentations from our symposium. What I'd like to talk to you about in this presentation are three things that you need to remember about neurology and just forget the rest, literally. So the three things that we'll cover today are how to tell central from peripheral vestibular disease, because I know this is a problem you see in your practices from time to time. Epilepsy, one of the most important things is the first seizure usually occurs between five and one year of age. And then the last thing we'll do is how to get deep pain assessment correct, because that's quite challenging, I know. So how do we tell central from peripheral vestibular disease? One of the key things to remember in this is that both central and peripheral vestibular disease cause general vestibular signs. So just take a second or two to try and think of what some general signs are. Well, I'm sure you've come up with a few options, but general signs of an animal with vestibular disease are listed here. So if you had a couple of these on your list, you're correct. Animals can usually show a head tilt, a stagmus. Note that that's horizontal or rotary if it's just a general sign. We'll come to that a bit more later. Strabismus, ataxia, drifting, leaning, falling, rolling, vomiting. So this animal here has very dramatic vestibular signs, as I'm sure you'll agree. Her name was Angel. But we don't know if this is central or peripheral vestibular disease. So how do we tell? So both cause general signs, but what does central mean? Well, what central essentially means is brainstem. In other words, part of the central nervous system. Therefore, animals with central vestibular signs have brainstem signs. On the other hand, what does peripheral vestibular disease mean? Well, peripheral is, is equivalent to the ear, the receptor outside of the central nervous system. And so an animal with peripheral vestibular disease has no brainstem signs. That's the second key point in this process. So this animal, you would pick up on the fact that this animal has central vestibular disease because the brain stem that's affected in central vestibular disease is very similar to the cervical spine. It's just a little bit further along into the skull, but essentially all of the long tracts that supply proprioception or motor function travel through the brain stem to get down and travel through the cervical spine. So this animal clearly has posture action deficits in in one front leg. So you would have to say this animal has signs of central nervous system involvement and therefore has to have central vestibular disease to account for its slight head tilt that doesn't show very well on this slide. So the arrow here is pointing at the brain stem just inside the skull and what would other signs of brain stem disease be? What else resides in that area. Well, you don't have to be a wizard in your anatomy to remember that some things come off the brain stem. And so that's right. These animals might be expected to have some cranial nerve signs. What else might they have? I often ask people, what woke you up this morning before your alarm clock? Well, it was your brain stem. So an animal with brain stem disease might have altered mental status. The brain stem is also close to the cerebellum, and so an animal might well have cerebellar signs. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So these are features of central vestibular disease that would differentiate a case from an animal with peripheral vestibular disease. If it had any of these signs, and the reason I've got four brain signs on here is because the thalamus, which is part of the forebrain, actually regulates 
the vestibular system, and so animals, some animals with thalamic disease near the pituitary will show central vestibular disease as well. So the peripheral vestibular disease, that would show signs equivalent to ear disease potentially, but it would have none of the above signs that we saw in the previous sign, slide associated with central vestibular disease. There are two exceptions though, and that's why I had something in brackets on the prior slide you might go back to. There's one cranial nerve that can be affected in peripheral vestibular disease, and that's right, that's the facial nerve, because the facial nerve um, runs through the bulla uh, in dogs and cats, or very close to it, and it also passes just underneath the horizontal canal. So it may be affected in an animal with severe peripheral vestibular disease and otitis media, as they often get, or, or severe otitis externa. The other exception is another nervous structure that runs through the, the tympanic bulla that can give a, a sign in animals with peripheral vestibular disease. You guessed it, that's Horner syndrome. So an animal with peripheral vestibular disease might have facial paralysis, it might have Horner syndrome, but actually that those two features together would tell you this is peripheral and not central vestibular disease. Because animals with central vestibular disease, although they may have facial paralysis, do not have Horner syndrome. So one of the features of vestibular disease is that animals can compensate, and that's true whether they have central vestibular disease and brainstem signs or if they have peripheral vestibular disease. They'll often compensate quite quickly. So here, let me pose a question to you that I know you don't have the answer to unless you're or actually at my lecture. How do you know if you've got tertiary syphilis? And you might think that I'm a bit crazy for raising this, but bear with me because this does have bearing on vestibular disease. So let's, uh, before we answer this question, I'll pose another set of questions to you. So what senses help you balance? Obviously the vestibular system helps you balance, but there are two other senses that are very important in telling you where you are in this world. So vestibular and your organ of vision and your organ of balance or proprioception. So you use these things in combination to help you balance. And the answer to the question about how do you tell you've got tertiary syphilis is as follows. We had an old anatomy instructor who used to say to us, boys, because even though the class was largely girls, he was used to calling us boys, because that's how he'd addressed every other class for the last 30 years. Boys, how do you know if you have tertiary syphilis? Well, when you get up in the morning and wash your face, if you fall over, you have tertiary syphilis. And the reason for this, and he'd spent a lot of time in Africa, so presumably some of his friends, or maybe even he, had developed tertiary syphilis. Tertiary syphilis uh, gradually, in this phase of the disease, attacks the vestibular nuclei in the brain, but it does it slowly. So the person compensates using their visual input and their proprioceptive input. But if you've got damaged central nuclei, and you get up in the morning and wash your face and cover your eyes, you deprive yourself of visual input and you'll fall over. Because presumably just proprioceptive information is not sufficient for you to keep your balance. So that's an example of how a person might decompensate themselves. Well, it, it doesn't help us very much with animals, except in this regard. So if we have an animal with compensated vestibular disease, we can decompensate them by turning them upside down, turning their visual input upside down and taking proprioception away. And this animal is upside down, and you see it's developed nystagmus. So useful, because then you can determine the direction of the nystagmus, which in this animal's case seems to be horizontal, uh, fast phase to the left. So away from the side of the lesion, you'd say this dog has right-sided vestibular disease. Now let me show you a cat that 
uh, I was smart enough to video when it was the right way up and show that it does not have nystagmus. Brief section with the cat the right way up on the towel. And then you might catch the a flurry as we whip him over onto his back. And then here on his back, clearly, because he's decompensated and we've taken away his visual and his proprioceptive information, he's got nystagmus. And furthermore, this helps us because it's vertical in direction. And from some of the previous slides, you will note that if ever you see vertical nystagmus, it's central vestibular disease. Again, the cat the right way up, no nystagmus. So very useful to permit you to differentiate central from peripheral vestibular disease. So a summary slide now. The signs of central vestibular disease are listed there, but note that both of them will show general signs in addition. Both the central and the peripheral will show central signs, but the differentiating features are as shown, and one of the most useful is if they show vertical nystagmus when you turn them on their back to decompensate them.